I'm Micah Smith with Denver 7 and welcome to Denver Decides. This community partnership is dedicated to accessible and transparent elections. The partnership includes the League of Women Voters of Denver, Interneighborhood Cooperation, and is presented by Denver 8 TV. Our mission today is to present a ballot issue forum in anticipation of the general election coming up on Tuesday, April 4th. On this year's ballot is referred question 2-0. 2-0 asks the voters if the city should authorize the release of the city-owned conservation easement on privately owned property as the Park Hill Golf Course, which requires the land to be used primarily for related purposes and allow for commercial and residential development, including affordable housing and public regional park, trail, and open space. Our format for this forum will follow a basic debate outline with opening and closing statements, rebuttals, cross-examination, and will include responses to questions submitted by forum organizers. Let's begin by meeting the participants who will discuss the pros and cons of referred question 2-0. Beginning at my right is Reverend Terry Hobart from St. Thomas Episcopal Church and a member of the Park Hill CBA Commission. She will be speaking in favor of referred question 2-0. And on my left is Penfield Tate. And Penfield is a volunteer with Save Open Space. He will be speaking against referred question 2-0. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. We will begin with 90 second opening statements from both speakers. And uh, we have first up Reverend Hobart, who will be speaking again for referred question 2-0. You have a minute and a half. Thank you. It's good to be here speaking in favor of 2-0 this, this evening. We all know that, that Denver desperately needs housing solutions. But we have also learned from past experience in Five Points, Central Park, and Lowry that we can't always trust developers. We need a new approach to development in Denver. The Park Hill CBA Coalition has one. We have signed a comprehensive, legally binding, enforceable community benefits agreement with Westside. Our agreement provides far-reaching benefits for Northeast Denver and guarantees that the developer will follow through on all commitments, including affordable housing. Our coalition of 10 local nonprofits stands behind this agreement and we will enforce it. Go to our website, parkhillcbacoalition.org and see for yourself. The community benefits agreement is a game changer. It is tied to the land. It provides a new collaborative model, model for development. It guarantees millions of dollars in community benefits, protects against displacement, and compels the developer to deliver on all affordable housing commitments. Denver can be confident that the approval of 2.0 will absolutely provide affordable housing, our fourth largest park, and unprecedented community benefits for Northeast Denver. A vote for 2.0 is a vote for parks and homes, but more importantly, it's a vote for people, climate, justice, and community. And now the opening statement from Penfield Tate, speaking against referred question 2-0. You also have a minute and a half. Good evening. In 1997, Mayor Webb purchased a perpetual conservation easement for the people of Denver over the land that used to be the Park Hill Golf Course. I'll be referring to it as the protected land. That easement is governed by state law, not by any city ordinance. And the purpose of the easement was clear. Mayor Webb wanted the land preserved for the people of Denver for recreation and open space. The easement says that it can be used for golf course, ball fields, and tennis courts and other permitted uses. The key is recreation and open space. When the developer Westside bought the land, it knew it was buying a golf course and land that could not be developed under state law. They cut a deal with the current mayor to close the golf course for three years in an effort to try to persuade you to let them make a fortune by developing this land. The developer shut down the golf course and really didn't allow public access. They began working to develop the land with the city. Both were ignoring state law that makes clear that in order to dissolve this easement or change it, you need a court order saying that the land or the land around it has changed so that it's impossible to use the land for recreation or open space purposes. They can't make that showing. That's why they're moving forward with this misleading ballot title and have this tortured land deal to try to avoid the jurisdiction of the courts. But we'll talk about this more this evening. 
And now, Mr. Tate, you will have one minute for a rebuttal to Reverend Hobart's opening statement. It's interesting that the developer is now talking about a community benefits agreement. For many of us in the community, and I live in Park Hill, the development of this agreement was done in secret with people whose identities weren't revealed. But now that the document's been disclosed, it's clear it's a developer benefits agreement because the city and the developer picked who would participate in putting this agreement together. The participants on the, uh, uh, negotiating with the developer are being paid something like $50,000 for their management. They're also compelled to support development on the site. They don't represent the community. That's why they hid their identities from everyone else. They don't have the ability to enforce it because they don't have any money to enforce the agreement. And more importantly, they're trying to assert control over the rights of the community without including the community in the process. It's a sham, and it isn't protecting the community from developer abuse. It's the same old game. Terry Hobart, you now have one minute for a rebuttal to Mr. Tate's opening statement. Mr. Tate, you, can pit, you continue to dismiss and diminish the voice of anyone who supports 2-0 to suggest that the community leaders and advocates are in the pocket of the city or the, the, or the, the developers, well, that's downright insulting. These people do not live in million dollar homes in South Park Hill. They live in urban decay in the midst of Northeast Denver. Are you suggesting they do not have the ability or the intelligence to think for themselves and know what best serves their community? That tactic's been used for, for years by people of privilege to silence the voice of the marginalized. It's hubris to suggest that a process is a sham just because you and your well-resourced homeowners of SOS were not consulted on the needs of Northeast Denver. You cannot invalidate a well-intentioned multi-year process that included conversations with over 350 neighbors of the golf course just because you do not like the outcome. The community and its leaders are all in for parks and homes and community benefits. And your portrayal of this process does not change that fact. Now we move to our cross-examination rounds, and we be begin with Reverend Hobart. You may ask Penfield a question, and Penfield, you will have one minute to reply. I assume that you agree that Denver faces a housing and affordability problem? And I assume that you are well-intentioned and you want to solve this problem. And that should be the case since you're considering a run for office, um, city council out large, I believe. So given these legal mandates that we have with our community benefits agreement, and given Denver will also get 100 plus acres of park, a grocery store in a food desert and displacement protections, how are you continuing to stand against this? Reverend Hobart, I've lived in Park Hill for nearly 40 years. I've represented Park Hill in the State House and I've represented Park Hill in the State Senate. I understand the community. I understand what the community wants. I've read all of your documents. I'm also a development finance attorney, so I've read them. Number one, the agreement does not guarantee a, a grocery store and the developer doesn't have one. Number two, it's interesting that you're here and not the developer tonight because they're hiding behind this veneer of community support because they know they can't justify their actions. This land, it's not a hundred acre park, it's barely 50 because the city already owns the stormwater drainage that's 25 acres. We keep getting misinformation and half-truths, and we're not moneyed interest. I'm a volunteer. I'm someone who lives in the community, and I hate to see what the developer has done coming in here trying to tear up our community because they want to maximize their profit potential. They can make money, just not on the rare open space in our city. Now, Penfield, you may ask Terry a question, and Terry, you will have one minute for your response. Terry, isn't it true that the developer knew that when it bought the land, it was subject to a perpetual conservation easement and that they weren't allowed under state law to develop on the land? You know, decades ago, the owners of this property wanted to run a golf course. And the developers who bought the land talked to their, consultant, to their attorneys to determine how they could legally approach the city and actually do something with this property that would actually serve our community. Because we all know that in today's world, with the housing shortage and the climate, climate change, golf courses just do not make sense. 
The real question is what happens if we don't change this easement? A yes vote means parks and homes and millions of dollars invested in Northeast Park Hill. A no vote means a golf course, and it's just that simple. Every day this week, there has been an article about our housing crisis, rising rents, and the need for, a need for housing solutions. We need housing now. There are 500 open seats in schools around the golf course. You want to know why? Because families cannot afford to live there. That's one of the reasons that the Denver Teacher Union supports 2-0, because it addresses this critical need now. Let's continue with cross-examination, and this time, Fen Penfield, your turn to ask Terry a question, and Terry, you'll have one minute to answer. I think I just asked her a question. We usually change oh. who goes first for each round. Oh, okay. Um, Terry, why does the developer keep insisting that there are going to be 100 acres of park when the development agreement it signed clearly states that only 80 acres are zoned for parks, 50, only 55 acres are really viable parkland, and of the 80 acres, 25 acres is already taken up and owned by the city for the stormwater pond. Mr. Tate, I'm not the developer, but I can tell you that when you add up all the numbers that you just put together, there's going to be more than 100 acres of open space. In addition to the 100 acre park, which does include the stormwater drainage easement, which I actually pl play in at times as myself, which I have walked through, which my dogs have walked through, it is usable land. And to continue to try and exclude that from open space does not make any sense. In addition to the, the park, there will be 300 feet of open median between all of the buildings, making a corridor where you could actually see the mountains. You keep wanting to, to bring up these, these arguments about open space, but this is privately owned land, and Denver has the opportunity to convert it to a 100-acre park. And the opportunity is now. If we don't vote yes on 2-0, it will return to a golf course because that's what the easement requires, and we will lose this opportunity. Now, Terry, you may ask Penfield a question, and Penfield, you'll have one minute for your response. Mr. Tate, along with every mayoral candidate and city council candidate, you talk about the importance of affordable housing. What projects in the pipeline do you support that would provide 650 permanently affordable units? And be specifics, please. You know, um, Reverend Hobart, it's interesting the developer has you here saying this. What everybody misses is the fact that the majority of this development is going to be concrete poured on open space to support commercial development, some retail development. 75% of the housing is going to be market rate, not affordable. I have lived in this community for over 40 years. I have watched the forces of gentrification destroy the fabric of the community. This development is just the new redlining of the 21st century. It's not going to create affordability, nor will this deal preserve it. There are affordable housing developments being done now to the north, to the west. Colorado Coalition for the Homeless has done a development to the west. The Urban Conservancy Institute, Land Institute, did one to the north. There are others planned to the east. So there's affordable housing being planned in this community. Um, no one else is proposing to, to concentrate this mass of 12-story buildings along Colorado Boulevard to build retail and commercial. Thank you, Penfield. And we move now to our next round. And for this round, Terry, you will begin first. You may ask Penfield a question. And Penfield, you'll have one minute to answer. Mr. Tate, members of Save, Save Open Space are opponents of 2-0. They have slandered organizations like Habitat for Humanity, Butterfly Pavilion, Brothers Redevelopment, and my church. Last week, a supporter of Save, Op of Save Open Space cussed me out at the top of her voice on church property. They have harassed and bullied people. They have driven away customers and filed complaints. Mr. Tate, as an official representative of this campaign, will you forcefully condemn the tactics and do it publicly right now? 
I will condemn the tactics and I expect you to tell the developer not to call me a liar in public at community forums. I expect you to tell their co-developer Halloran not to do the same thing. I expect you to tell their supporters, some of whom are with you here tonight, not to yell and heckle when we have community forums just because we disagree. See, many of you have had the opportunity to elect me to public office. And one thing I've always preached is we can disagree without being disagreeable. I don't mind that you're for this. That's your prerogative. And I have a right to be opposed to it, particularly as a nearly 40 year resident of the community. I have seen what has happened. I'm a finance and development attorney and I know things can be done differently. And I know the people of Denver are being taken advantage of. And now Penfield, your next question for Terry. Terry, and, and I'm sorry that, that you're here instead of the developer, but tell me why West Side in the city didn't even attempt to comply with state law and go to court and get an order saying that under state law, the conditions for setting aside the easement were met and that planning could get, go forward for redevelopment of the site. Well, Mr. Tate, I'm, I'm not a career politician. I'm not even an attorney. I'm a parish priest. And I came here to talk about housing and not frivolous lawsuits. I mean, tell the voters the truth. The last lawsuit that you filed against the developers, it was dismissed without a hearing. In 2020, you fought to give the voters of Denver the right to choose the future of the Park Hill Golf Course. Now that the voters are supporting 2-0, you want to take that right away. It's really not clear what you want, Mr. Tate. It seems like you and the well-resourced homeowners behind the Save Our Open Space are running a noise and propaganda campaign to promote personal interest and deny affordable housing and community benefits to Northeast Denver. That brings us to our final cross-examination round and Penfield Tate. You will start it off with a question for Reverend Hobart and Terry, you will have one minute to answer. Reverend Hobart, you would agree that the conservation easement says that uses on the land are not limited to golf. And it says specifically that the land can also be used for ball fields, tennis courts, and other uses consistent with recreation and open space. Mr. Tate, I, I have read the easement. I have read the language that you just cited. I have also read opinions by attorney that say that the property needs to be used as a golf course if the easement is not actually removed. I mean, when you don't have a lot of good arguments, you got to make an issue complicated. But folks, this issue is simple. It's about parks and homes. It's about people who, who need houses. It's about people who deserve to work and play and live in a neighborhood near where they live. A yes vote is going to provide much needed housing and affordable housing units, the city's fourth largest park, and millions of dollars in community benefits. That's why Habitat for Humanity, Brothers Redevelopment, Elevation Land Trust, Volunteers of America, and the Denver's Teacher Union all support 2-0. With, with the Community Benefits Enforcement Agreement, in place. There is not any downside to, for the voters of Denver. Reverend Hobart, your final question for Mr. Tate, and Mr. Tate, you will have one minute to answer. Mr. Tate, on the Jeff Bard show in 2020, you said that you did not want to ban development on the golf course. Just put it to a vote. You propose that after a community process exactly like the one we have followed, the, voice, the voters could decide. And I have this on YouTube, and if anyone wants to see it, you're welcome to reach out to me. Well, we followed that process, and our comprehensive benefit agreement is the result. And now that we have it on the ballot, you're claiming that it's impossible to lift the easement, and we should not be having the vote. Why have you changed your tune, Mr. Tate? Reverend Hobart, I haven't changed my position. I've been consistent over the last four years, which is why I filed the first lawsuit. And the court simply dismissed it because they said it was premature because the city hadn't taken final action. City Council's actions on January 23rd are final action. Secondly, the reason 
I have an issue and so many people have an issue is we're just asking for something fundamental. We're asking for a developer and our government to follow the law. The law says that if you want to modify a conservation easement, you have to go before a judge and have the judge approve it. The law under city ordinance 301 that 62% of you approved in 2021 says, and if that happens, then a citywide vote is also necessary. To the, so there's two steps that has to happen to allow this development. What is shameful is that the city and the developer have worked a convoluted land swap to try to avoid complying with state law. Now our speakers will respond to questions submitted by our forum organizers. Each speaker will answer each question and they will have one minute for their answers. Penfield Tate, who is here speaking against referred question 2-0, you will be the first to answer. What do you see happening to the Park Hill Golf Course if the measure does not pass? If the measure does not pass, a couple of things will have to happen. Under the deal the developer cut with the city that allowed them to shut down the golf course and mothball the land for three years, if development is not approved either by the court or the voters, they have to reopen a golf course. But only the developer has to do that. The developer then has to decide what it wants to do to comply with state law. The land is subject to a conservation easement and it's limited to open space and recreation. The developer can decide what uses it wants to activate on the site that are consistent with recreation and open space. The developer can sell the land to someone else. The developer can sell the land to the city and let the city work with the community and decide how to use the land. But there is no requirement that it be a golf course unless the developer decides that that's what it wants to do. We still have our future and hold our future in our hands. We are desperate for open space. We are desperate for green space and a tree canopy. And that's what we need to fight to preserve. Now, Reverend Hobart, who is here speaking for referred question to O, your response to that question, what do you see happening to the Park Hill golf course if the measure does not pass? Well, again, I'm here as an adv advocate for the community and the neighbors around the golf course. And so I cannot say definitively what the developer will ultimately do, but I understand that the developer has one choice if the easement is not passed, and that is to return this land to a golf course. And you all know, I don't have to tell you how bad golf courses are for our environment. They do not house people, they do not revitalize communities, and they use hundreds of millions of gallons of water and tons of pesticide and fertilizer each year. So let's hope that the voters of 2-0 see through all of this and they actually vote to approve parks and homes because that's what's best for the community. Okay. We'll move to round two of questions. Our next question from our organizers for our guests. And Terry, you will respond first. You'll have one minute to answer. Approximately how much in campaign expenses does your side plan to spend? Well, my side, which is Park Hill Coalition, is a grassroots, a truly grassroots effort, and we are not spending anything. I can't speak for the developer because I'm not part of the developer's campaign team. Okay. And now, Mr. Tate, your response to that question. Um, we will spend a fraction of what the developer spends, and Reverend Hobart, under this community benefits agreement that you tout, you are a part of the developer's campaign team. You and the groups that signed it are compelled by the agreement to lobby for, to speak publicly for the development. And you're getting paid $50,000. You are part of the campaign effort. Uh, the developer is going to spend millions of dollars. As I said, we're a bunch of neighborhood citywide volunteers. We collect money. People donate. Candidly, I'm not the treasurer. Uh, my guess is we may raise $50,000 or so. We didn't raise a whole lot when we won three uh, 301 by a 62 to, to 38 margin with your help. I would also note that 68% of the people in the precincts on which the land, protected land sits and surrounding it supported 301 and open space by a, a measure of 68%. Let's continue with questions submitted by the forum organizers and Mr. Tate, you will respond first. You have one minute for your response. How much has the value of the land increased by City Council's recent rezoning of the land? You know, that's interesting. Um, and I would note for the, the, the watcher, the viewers, the city's actions to rezone 
aren't valid at this point because the conservation easement is still in effect. But what's interesting is if you look the, at the Denver Post article uh, in terms of what it estimates the value of the land is without the easement. Now, remember the developer paid 24 million, then got paid 6 million when the city condemned the stormwater site. So they only paid 18 million. And the Denver Post estimates that the land without the easement is going to be worth somewhere around $184 million. And this is part of the insanity. The developer wants you, the people of Denver, us, the people of Denver, to give them that asset for free. We paid for it with tax dollars. And they're now saying so that they can do commercial development and make a bunch of money, we need to give them a $184 million asset that belongs to the people of Denver. And now, Terry, your response to that question. You know, I, I'm, I'm not speaking for the developer. I'm speaking for the community. But what I will say is the Denver Post used really fuzzy math. So let me just give you a little bit of holy math. Revitalizing perennially underserved communities, providing family housing, maintaining diversity, preventing displacement, and creating economic opportunities, well, that's priceless. You fail to assign any value to the social justice benefits as well as additional property taxes, the construction of significantly more affordable ho housing than the city requires, land donated for roads and utilities, and the donation and the development of the city's fourth largest park. I mean, where else are you going to find a deal like this? Mr. Tate and his friends, they keep wanting to make this a referendum on the developer and the Hancock administration. The question isn't, can you trust Westside? The question is, can you trust the community? Can you trust Habitat? Can you trust Brothers? Can you trust Volunteers of America, the Butterfly Pavilion? Can you trust the Park Hill CBA Coalition? And that brings us to the end of our Q&A segment, and we move now to closing statements. Each speaker will have 90 seconds for a closing statement, and we will reverse the order of the opening statements, which means we will begin with Penfield Tate. You have one minute for your closing statement. Thank you for being with us this evening. I think the choice is pretty clear. And what illustrates it is the recent editorial by the Denver Post where they said, quote, a sweetheart deal, just not for Denver taxpayers. It's sad that the developer didn't want to show up and go on camera and talk with you about their proposed development. But instead, they send some people from the community who they have by contract compelled to support their effort, who by contract they're compelled to donate money to the operation to try to come speak on their behalf. Well, let me tell you, SOS Denver is all community-based volunteers, residents in Park Hill and around the city who are fighting to preserve a neighborhood that many of them have lived in for 40, 50, 60 years. They reflect the will of the people. All you have to do is look at the vote two years ago on 301, where 62% of us said we want to preserve this as open space, and 68% of the people closest to the golf course said absolutely we want to preserve this for open space. There's no reason for us to give the developer uh, 124 or 184 million dollar gift and I know Reverend Hobart criticized it as fuzzy math but the irony is is the Denver Post got the numbers from the developer because they met with them before they wrote the editorial so if the math is fuzzy it's because the developers you work for are trying to sell somebody um, uh, 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 a sham deal please vote no on 2-0 Thank you, Mr. Tate, for that minute and a half closing statement. And now, Reverend Terry Hobart, you will have a minute and a half for a closing statement. I will clarify. I do not work for the developer, and neither does the coalition. We negotiated, we collaborated, and we're all in, and we agree for, on this. We're, we are working for this because we believe in it, and we received funding so that we could actually hold the developer accountable. As you all see through this evening, the opposition continues to keep moving the goalpost, issuing frivolous lawsuits, whatever they can think of to delay this process. Affordable housing denied, affordable housing delayed is affordable housing denied. It's time to stop this madness. Denver is not going to get a better deal. We have extracted unprecedented community benefits from the developer, and this project provides much needed homes now, and the developer is giving us our fourth largest park. 
it's time to get this done. Mr. Tate, you seem like a nice enough guy. This is an opportunity for you to get on the right side of history, to get people into homes, to build generational wealth, to revitalize a community, to create a nationwide model for justice-oriented redevelopment in Park Hill. Imagine all the energy you are deploying to oppose this landmark project. If it was redeployed to help build homes and build up community, let's make this a reality. Endorse 20, yes, for parks and homes. We may even be able to get your name on a park bench. Denver, it's time to embrace innovative solutions. I urge you to vote yes for parks and homes. On behalf of the forum organizers, I'd like to thank both of you for your participation in this forum. We hope we've given you a fair look at the pro and con arguments for referred question 2-0. Again, 2-0 asks the voters if the city should authorize the release of the city-owned conservation easement on privately owned property as the Park Hill Golf Course, which requires the land to be used primarily for related purposes and allow for commercial and residential development, including affordable housing and public and regional park, trail, and open space. Our thanks also to the Denver Decides partners, which include Interneighborhood Cooperation and the League of Women Voters of Denver. Denver Decides is presented by Denver 8 TV. Remember, Denver's municipal election takes place on an earlier date than ever before. Tuesday, April 4th is Election Day. Be sure you are registered and be sure to make your voice heard. Vote. For complete election information online, go to denverdecides.com or denver7.com slash denverdecides. Stay with us for more Denver Decides candidate forums coming up shortly. I'm Micah Smith for Denver 7. Thanks for joining us.